All right, everybody. I am Kathy Close Guest. I am your host. I'm the founder of Keeping It Human. I'm an improviser and storyteller. And with me today is somebody who is sort of my soul sister in a lot of ways. And not only does she have two K's, you know, just the alliteration works, Kathy Close Guest and Kat Coppet, but she is the founder of Coppet.com and two P's, two T's, K O P P E T T.com. I want to make sure you guys get that right. Um, so you can look it up later. And we are both, you know, improvisers and storytellers. Uh, we do a lot of speaking. We work with a lot of leaders and teams on how to use storytelling. And we're both uh, practitioners in the, uh, I guess, religion of, of improv, I would say. <laughs> and, and we have the same hair and glasses. So we nobody's going to tell us apart. We do. Well, no, they will. They'll, they'll be just like, bangs. well, yeah, that's true. I have bangs and you don't, and you look lovely. Your hair looks lovely. So, and that's, I think that's part of, you know, what's most important is that. We also have like pictures and whiteboards we behind do. us. It's a little, and the, like the thing, it's a little bit eerie. It's kind of weird now that you say it. I kind of, you know, um, if we're not in the same room at the same time, can people actually prove that we're different know. people? I don't know, maybe it's just a mirror. <laughs> it's like, no, we're, we're, we're definitely mirrors. Well, what's really funny is, um, you know, Kat, Kat's been um, in the improv community and, and going to um, different conferences. I met her at the Applied Improv Network Conference or AIN, which is a really wonderful conference. And we've both spoken at places like AIN and Funny Biz, but never at the same time. So we've never been <laughs> in the same room to be in a speaking thing at the same time. Oh, hmm. So it's like, hmm, I don't know. Hmm. All right. Hmm. Well, she's very, she's really uh, wonderful and I'm glad she's here. So, all right. Um, let's kind of jump in and see where the conversation goes. I sort of started the, the um, conversation at the beginning with just maybe we'd sort of talk about storytelling and improv. We'll see where it winds. We'll see what the questions oh. are. Um, for those of you new to uh, Blab, it's very improvisational. It's a really improvisational medium. So don't worry. Um, the conversation kind of ebbs and flows and uh, we are recording it if you have to drop off. So let's talk about, let's jump on in. And one of the things I'm fascinated by is the, the sort of this tipping point. I think we've reached a trajectory or a tipping point of uh, leadership and storytelling and improv where leaders actually are starting to recognize that this is not a soft skill. It's actually a critical mm. leadership skill. And if I read one more article, mm. Kat, that describes uh, storytelling as a soft skill, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, someone, someone's gonna lose it. Uh, it's not a soft skill. So let's start there. Let's let's talk about that. Well, the first thought I have as you're saying it, as I was just thinking the other day, it feels like I don't hear the term soft skill as much as I used to. It feels yeah. like a kind of 80s, 90s language. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if that's really true or if it's just the conversations yeah. I'm having. What do you think about that? Like. Just even the distinction between hard and soft skills feels like it's less I, that the that in the zeitgeist, the idea yeah. that emotional intelligence and relationships yeah. and all of those things that are something other than just technical knowledge or um, or content expertise are have so clearly been both proven and experienced as important to navigating yeah. the world today that soft and hard don't even have any. Yeah. It's a really great question. Um, I think leaders more and more, uh, heads of companies, heads of organizations are getting the message. But what's really interesting is that I still see a lot of trainers still breaking out. <laughs> Uh, I see it a lot. Trainers break out hard and soft skills training, and I'm not really sure why. So I think mm. the message is getting to the top of the organization. People are getting it, but I still see that boundary, which this artificial division, which makes very little sense to me, yeah. ha happening at the training level. And I think it's just, it's an old habit. I think that just has not died in ugly death yet. <laughs> and mm. I think that. It, it it will it's getting there um but yeah i still kind of see a little bit of that but i think the very smart organizations and the very smart leaders that get it get it and it, there's not that division anymore i wonder maybe if it's something more like you know as, as you're talking i'm thinking yeah. i think one of our jobs as trainers right and 
is to is to be able to cater, is to be able to hone or focus when we're training on what is it I'm focusing on right now? Like, you know, when I'm designing this moment yeah. of learning, what am I focusing on? So right. to that end, I suppose there's some value in being able to make distinctions, right? Like, is mm -hmm. this knowledge? Is it a skill? So I wonder if maybe a more useful distinction than hard skills and soft skills might be, um, one of them might be, I'm making this up, like, universal skills mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. specific contextual skills mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. here's a like coding might be a specific contextual skill that i need to have in this particular job description yeah. to do this particular task yeah um that i might not need to have you know to uh, negotiate a contract yeah but, there are other skills that are sort of universally important whenever there are two human beings in the same room together. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. No, it's an, it's an interesting one because I think, I, I, yeah. And I, I don't either. I, And, and and I don't need to have a lot of questions. I don't have a lot of answers, but I think interesting about because I think that becomes um, those distinctions become I think more meaningless over time. They really are. I mean, a leadership skill is a leadership skill. go okay i think there we go okay we lost Hi. it for a second yeah was it me because uh yeah. i'm okay sorry yeah yeah, I lost. <laughs> yeah yeah no it looked like um basically you, we lost video and we lost audio for oh, you dear. Um, and no worries no worries well let's let's also talk about i think you know one of the, the big topics here is how you in, how improv can really enrich storytelling and there's so many ways i know it's like boiling the ocean because when i get that question too i go well where do you start because it's a big thing um you know, what are you seeing in 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 organizations out there that you're working with how is how are people getting the message or or really understanding the spirit of how improv can really make their their storytelling better and how are they embracing it what's what are they working with i think the biggest distinction between thinking about approaching storytelling as an improviser and all of the other ways that all of the other communities that are coming to storytelling is an obvious one which is that uh, improvisers are making it up in the moment as they go, as opposed mm -hmm. to working too hard to script or yes. craft their stories ahead of time. I mean, yeah. duh, in some ways it's a <laughs> chronological answer yeah. to the question. Well, we're improvising. Uh, so what do I mean when I say that? I think that um, there there are some things that are that we have in common, right? Which mm -hmm. is that we look at learning about narrative structure and universal narrative symbols and what makes a story compelling, whether it's uh, genres or characters yeah. or um, points of conflict or obstacles and overcoming them or moments of change and transformation, whatever it is that are the elements of good storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, the other things that improvisers, what improvisers do then is say, how do I get really good at no, at, at receiving what exists in the moment. So sort of doing that, um, doing that in the present, yeah. right? So what exists right now that I could use to be inspired, that I can use as the catalyst, yeah. right? So if here's the platform, what is existing right now? Yes. And then what 
in this moment might be a catalyst for a change moment, what one of these things might not be just routine, but yeah. might be a why is today different moment that I could accept and build yes. with. And the other thing, I, I know I'm going on for a while, so just one more thought yeah. there. What the other thing then is that improvisers in some ways do storytelling backwards, mm -hmm. which means like, you know, like what the image that, uh, that uh, I think came out of Paul Sills and, and Second City was he used to talk about improvising as like telling a story by looking, like driving by looking in your rear view mirror. You can't really see the road in front of you. All you can see is where you've been. Yeah. So when you're storytelling as an improviser, what you're really doing is saying, okay, what are all the offers that we've made in the past? And how do I sort of foreshadow in reverse? Like, how do I take all of those things that have already happened and make them important yeah. as if yeah. I were setting them up to preview yeah. what was important at the end. Yeah. So I don't know. Those are my thoughts. Yeah. No, I well said. And, and we're not we're not under any time pressure. So, you know, no, no worries. I mean, take as much time as you need. And um, I thought I'd let you get a word in it. Not not at all. No, no. I'm I'm fascinated because we're both improvisers. We both work with storytelling. And I I'm I I very interested in hearing what other people see and hear and experience out there. And I think you're right. I think what's really something you said really struck me as being really spot on. And it's it's interesting because so much of leadership is being present in the moment, but we are taught as organizations, when we're dealing with organizations to have a plan, you gotta have the plan. So you gotta have the plan. Everybody needs a plan. Amen to the plan. Let's all worship at the altar of the plan. The plan is very important. Mm. And I think the hard part is, is for companies in today's dynamic environment to be able to trust themselves to let go of the plan and know when to when to stop the plan and to be improvisational and to, to tell the story differently. So just because you, and you see this all the time with the work you do with, with um, you know, presentations. It's, and, and I see it with, with pitch decks. It's knowing that, all right, you know your story well enough so that when you do get in front of an audience, or maybe it's a virtual audience, or maybe it's a physical audience, doesn't matter. Know your story so well that you know when to put the plan aside and say, all right, the story in the moment needs to change. The environment's different. The audience is different. The feeling is different. And trust your gut enough to be able to in that present moment, adapt the story. And I think organizations, some organizations, some startups are very nimble and they're very improvisational by nature. And then there's bigger organizations that just by the nature of, of being heavily matrixed and just very big and hierarchical, don't do that well. Right. And it's really an interesting skill and it's very hard to get some companies to understand that plans are great. What's even better? is known when that plan just has to be put aside. Right. For the, for the and that's where I think improv and storytelling at a high at a high level, forget the tactical marketing stuff, it, at a high level, I think needs to go. Well, yeah. and it's a polarity, isn't it? Yeah. Right, because yeah. on the one hand, um, I'm sure you have clients like this too, right? You can have chaos, Yes. right? You can have, um, we're a startup and we're going to just go and we don't want structure and we don't, you know, and, yeah. and management is bad and let's just <laughs> do what's needed right now and we're going to make a product and let's not have yeah. a plan. And, yeah. um, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and, and we're, we're saying, okay, what is your story? What's your yeah. North star? What is your yeah. vision? What are you driving toward? You know, and okay, we're here and we want to get here. Yeah. How do we have some structure to get there uh, is really what's needed. And then, as you were saying, you have uh, a whole bunch of other, you know, it's a more traditional problem yeah. where you're so connected to, I think there's a real should, you know, we're old enough yeah. to have grown up in, in with a lot of shame, at least I did, around not having a plan. I mean, my whole life, mm -hmm. personally and professionally, has been improvised, and it has taken me a very long time to not yeah. feel deep shame about the fact mm. that I sort of secretly didn't have a business plan mm. for a long time. I mean, my business is... Um, That's interesting. Yeah. We just celebrated our sort of official 10-year anniversary. Really, it's probably 15 years yeah. old as an organization, but officially... Wow. We're 10 years old, and I think it's really only 
you know, we had sort of a vague business plan maybe five or seven years ago on paper. It's the first, it's really only the last two or three years that we've had a CFO and, you know, financial plans and, you know, everything yeah. that wasn't kind of on the back of a napkin. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. No. And, and that's a really important point. Um, and, and I, I'm with you. I, and I don't see it as a polarity anymore. And I never did. I always thought the two ex needed to kind of coexist. Perfect, right? Yeah. 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 Totally. And I, cause I, 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 I put together a business plan. That's all nice and well and well and good, but we all know that plans, um, are four letter words. A plan is a four letter word. It, it's not gonna, sometimes it's gonna blow up and things don't go according to the plan. And if you're not nimble, what do you do then? So I, I've just always felt that plans are great, but plans uh, are just only half of the, the, the whole equation of success. And you're, you're, you're sort of talking to that. And I really love that. We've got a question. I want to address it because we're talking yeah. high, high level. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, you know, the thing about that I love about Blab uh, is that I always have to, if I look like I'm looking a lot of places I am, I'm having to watch the text chat window. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, so I apologize. I'm listening intently, but I'm also looking. I love it. I'm with you. For things, that's a great question. Yeah. yeah, we've got some great questions. So let's yeah. let's talk about um, Brenny. Brenny's got a great question. We haven't gotten there yet, but let's talk about it. Um, what are your thoughts about character and role in the story, as that might yeah. pertain to training? So yeah. character and role. Yeah, um, I I love this question. I just finished writing a, a blog post this week about uh, what a, a thinking about this. Um, my daughter went, did a casting, worked with a casting director in the city a couple months ago. She's 12 and uh, she, she brought in a song, which was a, a song about a 13 year old girl from the musical 13. And she brought in a, a Snoopy monologue and, um, and the, the casting director gave her great feedback. She had a wonderful time. And her reaction to the song was, that's awesome. It's a great piece for you. And gave her some notes. And her reaction to the Snoopy monologue was, uh, you should pick something else. Snoopy's a boy. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, and and my when she told me this at dinner later, when Leah told this, my head sort of exploded. I was like, Snoopy's a, you can't do Snoopy? What do you mean yeah. you can't do Snoopy? He's yeah. a, He's not a boy, he's a dog yeah. and he's like a cartoon dog who is like the symbol of wild imagination and being able to be anything you can be. And you're telling me that like the casting date record can't tell if you can act because like, you, you, okay. So so, the re so here's how this plays out. <laughs> <laughs> and let's, suspend, let's suspend the fact that Snoopy actually thinks he's a person and flies a house. Let's, let's forget that. I, I, you know, it's like Snoopy can be a vulture yeah. and a World War One fighter pilot, exactly. and like you know, I like, but you, you can't tell if yeah. a twelve-year-old girl can act because like the part she's playing, like it was mind blowing. So what I, what is important to me about this, and what I think is wonderful about the question and the idea of story and think exploring story in in the applied sense is, I think both in terms of um, how we look at and engage with others yeah. and how we think about and engage with ourselves. Mm. We yeah. do a huge amount of typecasting. Yes. And I think that to be fair to this casting director, she was asking, actually doing them a great service, right? Because her job is to be able to make instant assessments of, is there a match? between this thing that I need in this very complicated puzzle piece of putting together this show and that performer right there. Like I have a thousand puzzle pieces to pick from. Can I slot one in? What's gonna be the easiest fit? And as an actor, you need to know, can I make myself an easy fit for that puzzle? So I need to know what I'm coming yeah. in with, what will people see me as, what's the good yeah. fit and how do I present that, right? Yeah. So there's some positive things about how do people see me, what do I know I'm bringing into the room? Yes. How do I show that off? Yeah. How do I show up with my strengths and let people see them? Yeah. How do I um, manage what I know I'm showing up with? If I'm a, you know, 40 something little white woman yeah. with a master's, like what am I bringing into the room with me and how do yeah. I manage that? So that's all great. And where do I want to stretch that? Where might mm -hmm. I want to challenge that? Yeah. Where might I want to give other people an opportunity to yeah. 
show me other things? Where might, if I'm looking to hire, might I want to strip away what I think yeah. are requirements? You know, so there's a huge amount of how do I expand my range myself? Where do I give other people opportunities yes. to show up and play differently? Right. No, and, and I think you just hit on something really interesting because I and if I understand Brenny, there's there's a couple of parts to your question, and I know it's hard sometimes um in the text window to get the nuances, but there's the other side of the coin, which you kind of alluded to, which is in the training, in sort of training, um, it's not just the character we bring, it's the character of the people showing up. And everybody, unfortunately, here's what I don't like about the, the 21st century company is everybody has a title. Everybody has a title. But regardless of what that title is, it doesn't matter if I'm a senior director of marketing or if I am uh, an HR director, whatever that is, people tend to prescribe roles based on that protagonist and that title. And the reality is, is in a training environment, I think people are looking to be seen and heard beyond that role because everybody has an aspirational mindset. The reason they're doing training is to be better, to be different, to grow. And I think there's that other side of when we are thinking about ch challenges and training, I think we have to think about roles in terms of challenges, but not roles in terms of titles. And I think too often a lot of training kind of comes at it from a title perspective. And that really is meaningless to me. I think it's really what is the challenge to overcome? And that's where plot, when you're thinking about who is my, who's my protagonist, who's my audience, what are their challenges? Forget about their titles and their roles. The role will change. The role will be variable. But what if I understand their challenge correctly, then I can address that as plot, if you will, in, in the content that I'm providing in the training. And, and I think that's maybe um, what I think I understand a little bit of what she's saying. Well, yeah. And 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 as you know, and yeah. and you know, in actor parlance, right? When I'm playing a role, you know, the the Stanislavski question, right? What's my objective? Yes. Right. Like, what am I trying to accomplish in this scene? So I love that, you know, like in this role that I'm playing yes. right now, both in terms of at the role of like my yeah. role as manager in the company. Yeah. And also my role in this scene, you know, like yes. what does the scene need right now? What's my objective in this moment, in this little scene that we're co-creating? Abs absolutely. And, it, and that's a, a great way to look at it. It's a co-created story. It's a co-created story. And I'm not driving the story as a manager. I'm building it with my employees together. So how can I, in the training, think of it as a co-created story ending? Right. And how, where, where do I want that ending to go? And what's how much do I need from that other person? How do I, how much can I focus on them and make them look good and yes and them in that story? I think that's a that's so, such an important. So if we're circling then back to storytelling and the you know thinking of yeah. story in organization and my role and mm -hmm. character in the story, if you know there's that model of um, uh, villain hero villain victim yes. model, you know this yes. model, and so one of the things that we a lot of us tend to do when we're in an interaction is cast ourselves, you know, tell a story about what's happening in this interaction and cast ourselves in one of those roles as hero, villain, or victim. And if I'm feeling like the villain, I might be, yeah. you know, really ashamed or guilty or feel terrible. Or if I'm the victim, I might feel helpless or powerless. If I'm a hero, I might feel completely righteous. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm the good guy. And although at first glance, it might seem like, well, hero is great. It's great to cast yourself as the hero of the show. Not any of one of those is especially healthy, right? That's a that's a trap. Yes. That triangle. Yes. Right? And so, yeah. to be able to, one of the things that exercising your improv muscles and exercise yeah. sort of expanding your storytelling skills is to first of all to be, I think, aware that whatever story you're telling yourself is only one possible story. That's it. And there are probably 12 different stories. Mm -hmm. And what is this person over here? What story are they telling? Mm -hmm. What's this person over here telling? Mm -hmm. And also how might I stretch my range? What's, what's an, if, what if I weren't the hero of this story? Mm -hmm. What if I were just a person yeah. in this story? Mm -hmm. Or what if I'm not the villain? What if I'm a hero, mm -hmm. you know? Or what if I'm not the victim? What if I'm actually the you know wise sage counselor yeah and you know what can i exactly how reframing my i'm you know using what i'm 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 just sort of riffing on brenny's words i don't know what she meant by her question but what if my what if my 
I reframe my role or my character? What does that open up for yeah. me in terms of how I show up? It, precisely. And I think there's many more roles. There's many, many, many roles. And I think there's there's the enabler role. And maybe it's sort of part sage where you're the enabler in somebody else's story. They're the hero. You are the person who showed up at the right time to help them realize their wisdom. So maybe it's not about you. Maybe you're, you're sort mm -hmm. of a supporting cast role to right? somebody else's Academy Award, right? So somebody That'd else... Cool. So, you know, and, and, and sometimes I think in a training situation, um, we always have to remember that everybody has their own aspirations and they want to be the hero in their story. So our job as trainer, too, is how do we enable them to 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 be a hero to their organization, to be of service to their organization? Is there some support role? So I always see training as I, it's not about me. It's about that that supporting role. I might get a supporting nod if I'm lucky, but I want somebody else to get that Oscar. I want somebody else to 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 be that. And so sometimes you're just the Robin to somebody else's Batman. You don't have to be the Batman. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's kind of the way that you know I think about it. Um, uh, another question. Thank you, Brenny. That was a great question. Oh, good. That's exactly what she meant. She's she says thanks. <laughs> she says thanks, women. Thank you. All right, another question from uh, the Improv Company. It's a great question. Um, we're familiar with Ken Adams' story spine, um, and Kat and I are big, oh. big fans. Oh, worship at the Ken Adams, you know, theater, um, and we're both very familiar, intimately familiar with that with that model as well. Um, so they use it extensively in our training. But are there other models or resources that are useful when it comes to improv plus storytelling training? Is the question? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> The short answer is yes. Okay, we're done, everybody. Next question. Next question. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so, um, and and you're probably familiar with many, many of them. Uh, one of them, in terms of resources, is which you may already know, but for anybody else who's listening, is Ken has a whole book called How to Improvise a Full Length Play, yeah. and it is not directed at the applied audience at all. It's directed at improvisers, but it is chock full of many, many activities that uh, he has built to help get better at all aspects of creating and co-creating stories. So creating um, character, creating detail, getting better at conflict, you know, anything that you can think of that would go into creating a full length yes. play individually and collectively. Um, and and it's just an awesome book. It's it, So anytime, any, for anybody who wants to apply improv, they're great activities in there to steal. Anybody who's interested in narrative structure, it's they're great ideas to steal, and and that's a great resource. Uh, in addition to that, in a more specific sort of tactical way, in terms of activities I use with organizations around storytelling, um, one that I pair very often with the story spine, and I'm guessing the improv company probably uses this a lot too, yeah. but. It, our larger audience is color advance, which is about distinguishing between the advancing plot of a story, which is what comes next, what comes next, what comes next, and adding detail yes. and description. And it's great for, you know, it really is just one person tells the story and the other person coaches them mm -hmm. on whatever they, you know, at yeah. whatever point in the story, if I say, so I was walking down the street, you can say, color the street, and then they give lots of detail about the street. Or I was feeling really sad color, feeling sad. They can describe the inner thought. Yeah. So it doesn't literally have to be description. Yes. And what's what I love, there are a couple of things I love about it. One is it helps people really distinguish between when am I moving the action forward and when am I deepening or going, you know, going deeper or extending an explanation of a certain moment or a certain point. Yeah. And that is something that a lot of us have trouble with. So, you know, the example of the sort of um, archetypical character of the, the kind of ditzy old aunt who can't quite <laughs> tell a coherent story, you know, and just sort of starts in the middle yeah. and then kind of drifts off. Yeah. Part of that is about getting stuck in color, mm -hmm. right? Or if you have someone who tells a story and you're like, wait, I don't understand because they kind of just skip to the end. Um, yeah. so, so one is being able to distinguish, am I advancing the story or am I 
describing a moment. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I like about it. The second thing I like about it is when you are talking about shifting your story for a different audience, telling the same story for a different audience and being able to make it different for that different audience, mm -hmm. this, what the story spine can help you do is be really clear about the spine, yes. the key core message of your story. And once you have that, you should be able to tell it in a 30 second version yes. or an hour version. Yeah. And it pretty much stays the same, right? Like mm -hmm. any spine in any one of us looks the same, yes. right? You take any human being and you strip us off, we're all the same. So that is constant. The color part, the color, at, like wet, where I color is the part that shifts. And so when I start to know what the color is, what I can start to do is say, okay, now if I have five minutes to tell my story, here's the color that's most important versus if I have 60 minutes. Or if I'm telling the story to the CEO, here's the kind of color that he's gonna be interested in yeah. versus if I'm telling it to the CTO versus if I'm telling it to the HR yes. director versus if I'm telling it to mm -hmm. a manager in my training program. Right. So that's a very long, <laughs> really <laughs> colored explanation of why I like color. Advance. Well, you did preface it with color in advance. So we will, we will take that literally. Uh, that's a great question. Thank you, the improv company. And I, I agree. Um, I don't call it color in advance, but I love that you do. And I think that's a great apt description for it. I, I think it's really what you said. I take the middle, the heart of that story spine. My, fa my favorite part of that story spine is because of that, because of that, because of that. And I will go into four, five, six, seven layers deep with, with people because what it forces them to do is understand narrative structure and also get to the heart of the issue. Because a lot of times we'll say, well, because I bought this product, I made money or saved money. And that's a very shallow story because it's never about the economic benefit. It's about the bigger human issue. And when I force people to go peel back that onion and I may get clients to do seven or eight and, and they're like, are we there yet? And I'm like, you're not there yet. But the beauty about it is that when you finally strip it back to that thing that is so fundamental about that story, what is the big aha of that story? Then you know you have it. And so that, to me, that because of this and because of that can, can be some of the richest parts of that story spine model. And that's where I think a lot of people um, sort of maybe kind of skip over a little bit. And, and I force people to kind of, um, I'm a hard taskmaster on that, but I force people to go through it for a really good reason. I think that's really, really super important because it does provide such richness. And I think to your point, the story spine is just a spine. And once you have that basic story, understand that that story has to vary in color and depth and length to your, yep. as you're saying, to different audiences. Just so, so I always try to remind, remind people that it's just a spine. A spine is very, very important. But if all you do is follow the story spine, you might, you might be missing some important emotional details. So go, right. go back and, and see how you can really flesh it out till you have an emotional core. And I think that's really like that. when you know, when you know, at least that's, you know, in some of the, in the things that I see. But. No, I'm, gl I'm glad you said that, you know, there's a great article out there somewhere that Ken has written. You know, mm -hmm. there was, there were some blog posts written about like, where did it come from? And, you know, it, it was out there, Pixar had gotten out there in some Pixar yeah. tips, I think because Rebecca Stockley had yeah. sort of circled it back around to Pixar. And, uh, and then Ken wrote a blog in response to yeah. someone who had written a blog about something, yeah. sort of discovering the story spine. And one of the things that he wrote in his blog about the story spine, which is great, if we can find it, maybe we can link it to something at some point, I'll look for it, yeah. is exactly what you're saying, to really remember that the story spine is not the story. And you could do, I think what he does is the Wizard of Oz in his example. And there are major characters in the Wizard of Oz who don't show up when you story spine it. Right? Whole characters that yeah. don't show up, which doesn't mean they're not really rich, yes. delicious, important parts of the story. Yeah. They're just not part of that core narrative, right? If you're going to yes. tell it in three minutes, you could leave it out. So um, so I think that that's a really important thing. I feel like I, I also want to say, um, just to add a little more color to uh, mm -hmm. the improv company's question, um, there are 
hundreds more improv activities around story, oh, yeah. right? You know, so so we're Nuts. not doing justice to answering that question. Some others, uh, some other favorites of mine are, to Brenny's point, there's stuff that you can do around how you perform story. Yeah. There's stuff you can do around how you make story personal, mm -hmm. around how you tap into and discover and harvest story from your own life that I do with people. There's stuff around performing story and how do you flex your range yeah. around storytelling, mm -hmm. stuff around story sharing I do a lot yeah. of, story circle and finding um, meaning from yeah. sharing story. Uh, there's also stuff around um, playing, you know, again, story crafting, like yeah. and making it interesting, like how do you play with story structure in terms of, messing around with the timing of the telling, like where do you start, you, even if you have your story spine, once you have your story spine, it doesn't mean you have to tell the story in that order. Where That's do you right. want to start? That's right. How do you make it, you know, how do you raise suspense? Yeah. So there's That's a it. lot of- There's tons of activity, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, like, uh, no, doubt so, about, no doubt about it, no doubt. Yeah. It's, so maybe to summarize that, there's some stuff about um, generating and harvesting story, there's stuff around story crafting. Mm -hmm. There's stuff around expanding your storytelling range and, mm -hmm. and performance aspects around story. And then there's stuff around sort of applying storytelling tools to other activities, like using story for visioning, mm -hmm. using story for problem solving, mm -hmm. so that the point isn't building storytelling skills, but using story as tools for um yeah like for other things solving problems yeah. or generating ideas yes. or and I, I was just gonna segue i'm so with you i was just i was thinking that is that storytelling is not just storytelling it is storytelling is how we set up the way we frame a problem determines how we solve it and yes. how we yes. how we ask what is to say that again kathy that yes awesome. yes it's like how we frame a problem determines how we solve it so what is the story we tell ourselves about what the challenge is or what the problem is and i as, as you were talking and so well i was like totally with you i was vibing you because it's so true storytelling is is a way to solve other issues i've seen it used for solving um, product problems. I've seen it used for solving what are the internal challenges of any organization, engineering, whatever, because that story that we tell ourselves about what the challenge in front of us is will drive how we approach solving it. So I think storytelling is so rich, not just in the traditional way that we've always talked about is, oh, telling stories um, verbally or in writing, but a, a method of, of framing challenges and solving problems and how we uh, organize ourselves internally and within companies and how we get everybody to change directions when we need to lead and it's all these other things so i think it's very robust as a problem solving device oh yeah if if done in the, if done in the right way so i that's what i love about it and i think as improvisers i know um you know i i don't Kat probably agrees with this there's so many there it's just my head's been thinking of all the applications because there's so there's so many so well, what's, you know, what's, what's lovely about it and what comes to mind when you talk about it as a problem solving device is so much of the way we communicate with each other and mm -hmm. um, try to solve problems is about like, like a knife, right? Like yeah. here's the right answer, like, like going yeah. right for the like right or wrong or yeah. the one answer and storytelling is so not that it's so in my head, it's like, it's, it's round as opposed mm -hmm. to sharp. And yeah. so when you share a story, when you either go in to explore, create a story, or you share through story, um, it's, it's, yeah. it's nuance, right? It's gray. It's, it's mm -hmm. spherical. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, well, yeah, I don't yeah. know what the end of that sentence is, but <laughs> you, ev everything that's yeah. everything that's good about yeah. nuance and gray and spherical, which I'm sure, yeah. uh, obviously, there's a huge part of our world and our population that is anti-nuance and spherical yes. and gray. But for those of us who like nuance and spherical and gray, yeah. um, 
Well, and you said it so well. No, I think you said it so well. I mean, I don't think you even need to finish that sentence. It's it's because it's a con fully contained, wonderful sentence. And it's so true because it strikes me what you're saying is I think so much of, especially, you know, I, I sit in the heart of Silicon Valley and it's such an engineering mecca and, and, and an epicenter. And I think it's a beautiful thing. I think the hard part, and it, I think it's maturing, it's changing. But when it, engineers run companies, they look at it as, you know, the, the hammer and the nail. There's This is the problem and there's only one solution, which is the hammer. Or um, that there are shades of gray because code is binary. There's a right or wrong. There's one or zero. And that limits the range of possibilities that a company can explore. And what's so beautiful about story thinking is that story thinking allows us to go, oh, well, maybe, you know, there are shades of gray. And there's multiple solutions mm -hmm. depending on how, how we define the issue. Right. And that's why defining the challenge in any story is so important. It's like, what are the, what is it, the story that we're telling ourselves about the challenge? What is, in fact, the challenge that we should be solving? And there's probably 10, but what is the one that's the big one? And do we have the right one? And are we framing it the same way? Right. So I think story thinking is such an important skill that goes beyond communication. And I think we've always looked at it as a communication skill, but it's really a problem solving and, and really sort of more you know, uh, it's so much more agile and robust than I think we give it credit for. And I love when I see engineering minds, really brilliant engineering minds and CTOs and, and VPs of, of, of engineering go, oh, I get it. Oh my God, I get it. I get it. <laughs> well, because in fact, they're the, you know, en engineers are, are the, are, are some of the best, you know, problem solvers yeah. uh, among us. You know, they they yeah. understand puzzles and yeah. different ways of, you know, going around and saw that yeah. there's not one right answer, you know, as well as any of us. There's something in there as you were talking about yeah. finding, you know, recognizing that even if you are efficiently looking for just a right answer, that yeah. the question is, what is the right answer for me yeah. in this moment? right for this yeah. problem right yeah. now yeah. and that that might be different and i think maybe it's that i think maybe what i was searching for is there's something about story that allows the mm. receiver yeah. to find that right to search for and find what's what's meaningful for me yeah. right now in this moment uh yeah again for me as opposed to the teller saying here's what yeah. you should do yeah that's such a great way to put it and that's such a great welcome titch thank you for joining us um no that's such a great way to... and that's what i love about co-created stories we we just scratched the surface on co-created stories this has been a really great conversation and i want to uh, the power of being able to co-create a story where you're inviting people to help you define the story and define the challenge and then define the ending because I think that kind of open-ended problem solving invites people to be part of it and people may not frame it the same way and they probably won't which is so beautiful about having a team explore story to tell themselves what is the challenge we're really facing here and because and that's what's that's that's what's so beautiful about co-creating a story with an audience or co-creating with your you know with your customers or whatever it is because yeah. it's going to be so much better um, and this is, this is where improvisers get, you know, um, improv gasms <laughs> because we, we recognize that so much of it is that, are we on the same page? Hey, are you, are you, are you feeling this way? Does this make sense? And that, that just makes everything, the problem solving so much richer and better. I think, you know, I know I, I have to work an improv gasm at least once into every blab. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> so word, word of the day use it in nice. a sentence it's a noun nice. Nice. yeah but um um thanks for joining us everybody any more questions we're totally open i mean we could go i i know kat and i could probably go on and on and on and we just want to make sure that we're answering your questions and if anybody has any more questions yeah. well while they're thinking and feel yeah. free to talk to me if they yeah if anyone has a question um you're you're just talking about improv gasms and, and delighting your <laughs> And delighting your partner and sort of sh shared meeting. I uh, we had an uh, an all women improv group that we've been working with, and oh wow, um, we had a, we had a rehearsal wow. the other day where we were working on exactly this on on sort of testing the boundaries of how do you how do we delight each other and sort of finding out what what delights us and, mm. and what delights our partners and really making a distinction between what's good improv or the right 
you know, the yeah. right choice. And what's going to delight my partner? Because something that delights you might not at all delight someone right. else and vice versa. Right. And um, we did a, I, I was doing a scene with, with a, a, a friend, a partner in which she was a, um, she was a surgeon. And at the beginning of the scene, she'd washed her hands, right? She mm. did the whole washing her hands. And she was holding her hands in the scene like this for three, four minutes of the scene. And I had come in as a, in as a nurse with a cold. And so that, you know, the obstacle in the scene was like, I was like, oh no, it's fine. I took this new stuff. You know, the other doctor gave me this stuff and he said, I'm sterile, even though I was like hacking all over something. It was kind of, a, you know, a stupid little silly scene. But so, so that was sort of going on. And at some point, Oh no, Kat, we you froze. We we lost you. We lost you. Oh no. And she was telling a great story too. We lost <laughs> we lost her. Kat, you froze. So if we can let's see if we can get you back. Let's see if we can get you back here. Um all right. Can you call back in, Kat? I'm sorry, we lost your screen froze. Right at the middle about of telling this really, really great story. Oh no. Cat, call back. Um, well, she's calling back anybody. Um, just final final round for um, questions, if you have questions. There have been some amazing questions. Thank you, everybody, for, for those questions. We'll do more of these, because I think there's so much more richness to explore at the intersection of improv and storytelling. And those of you who, who do this as well know that to be true. There's so many ways to apply improv to storytelling, uh, whether it's at the at the sort of presentation level, it's at the it's at the marketing level, it's at the internal communications level, it's at the engineering problem solving level. Um, so many ways to apply it. So we will be having a lot more discussions, richer discussions. Um, Kat, we'll see if you can call back. We'll wait another minute. I'm guessing she's calling from Wi-Fi, from a Wi-Fi and not from a from a, a LAN, which probably is uh, very, she's got variable access, um, unfortunately. Um, all right, well, we'll give it a minute, but any final uh, questions? We'll go ahead and, and uh, give you guys a minute to go ahead and we'll wait a second here. All right, well, it looks like, you know, we don't have any more questions and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we've, we've lost Kat and she was right in the middle telling a great story. So we're going to have to get the ending of that story. We're going to have to do another one of these to, to get the ending of that story. Um, thanks everybody. Again, uh, I'm Kathy Cloats guest of keepingithuman.com and our guest was Kat Coppett of coppett.com. She and I are both, uh, Improvisers, storytellers at the intersection of that. I know at, at the improv company, right? I wanted to hear that story. I want she came in as a nurse with a cold, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be dying to to figure out what the ending of that story is. So I'm just kind of uh, at a at a loss. We'll do another one of these. We'll have Cat back, and uh, we'll we'll get the we'll get the ending of that story. I promise you. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Have a fabulous Friday. Have a great weekend. Take care, everybody. And we'll post this online um, and send it out on Twitter uh, in the next couple of days. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.